On April 9, the enemy launched a new offensive against German positions on both sides of Koyasol, with the main attack aimed at the XX Corps. Eight rifle divisions and four tank brigades, supported by aircraft, unsuccessfully attacked German positions until April 12. Howes stated that the objective of the April 9 offensive was Theodosia. The 132nd Infantry Division successfully repelled attacks by four infantry divisions and two tank brigades, which included approximately 100 tanks of various types. Despite heavy artillery fire from some 35 batteries of all calibers, together with intense air attacks, the German infantrymen held their ground. A total of 43 tanks were destroyed, among them the heaviest models as evidenced by the burning steel hulks that exploded and smoked in front of our positions for several days. Having once again suffered catastrophic losses, prisoners spoke of thousands of dead. The Russians on April 13 weakened their onslaught. According to the testimony of deserters and captured documents, the Russian divisions were bleeding, which forced the disbanding and reorganization of units that had just confronted us with all their might. Despite the major defeat and countless losses, the Russian command persisted in its original plan. Two more divisions were transferred to the Kerch Peninsula. The artillery on the front of the XX Corps was reinforced with 38 batteries, which were supposed to speak on May 1. For reasons unknown, this did not happen. Perhaps they were waiting for a German counterattack, or perhaps the Soviets were expecting further reinforcements. All attempts by the enemy, who had a huge advantage in numbers of troops and weapons, to recapture the Crimea and destroy Manstein's 11th Army ended in defeat. The German soldier, especially the infantryman, fighting in the most unfavorable conditions, defeated the enemy, who had an overwhelming advantage. On the night of May 7-8, the offensive was launched. All night endless columns moved eastward artillery guns, tanks, anti-aircraft guns, ammunition carriers and infantry companies concentrated along the few paved roads around the Bay of Theodosia. The breakthrough of Soviet defenses had destroyed concentrations of enemy troops in the staging areas behind the Parpacha positions, and this must be exploited at all costs. Now there was a chance to end the trench warfare in which the army had been dragged. Russian artillery was firing indiscriminate barrage fire. The Soviet Black Sea Fleet was also firing salvos from its ships at our troops on the march. One could see far to the southeast flashes of gunfire reflected in the black water, and the horizon was occasionally illuminated as in a distant summer thunderstorm. Within seconds of the flash, an explosion was heard in our areas of concentration. Despite the terrifying presence of the heavy artillery concentrated against us, the shells still fell haphazardly and did not do much damage. At high altitude over our heads and along the coast a lone Russian airplane rattled by. Already accustomed to this usual annoying thing, we infantry dubbed it Iron Gustav, sewing machine on the clock, raven of fog. This very airplane showered the ground with a stream of tracer bullets and could drop a few bombs, which, flying toward the ground, whistled so annoyingly that they could piss off the newly arrived newcomers. The old wolves were already well acquainted with these primitive night flyers. These airplanes assembled of wood and tarpaulin with a five-pointed star on the fuselage. Being one of the indispensable night elements of the war on the Eastern Front, they seemed to accompany us everywhere. The older frigators no longer even paid attention to them when they heard the rumble of the engine accompanied by the whistling of bombs, because they knew well that if a bomb could be heard, it would fall at least a hundred meters away. Finally came the order to attack Kerch. After this order, which for us meant a long-awaited change in positional warfare, the spirit of the troops in the trenches immediately increased. On May 8 at 3.0, a sudden powerful shaft of Russian artillery fire fell on us, but it was cut short very soon, at 3.10. At 3.10 the clock was checked, and at 3.15 the whole front exploded with a barrage of artillery fire. The shelling was carried out according to plan down to the smallest detail. Because of the darkness it was still impossible to make observations, and at 3.38 the first response was received from the Russian artillery, which brought down a shaft of fire on the factory area at Dalnaikamishi.
At 3.50, a heavy fire from Russian mortars briefly concentrated on the icebreaker. Quite obviously, the Russians had already been warned of our attack. As the fire shifted to the east of the turtle, trails of green and red tracer bullets became visible. At 4.2, German fighters and Stuka were already continuously in the air, and they were dive-bombing the Soviet ground positions, breaking away high above the battlefield from their groups, and their silhouette could hardly be distinguished in the pre-dawn sky. At 4.18, the first Russian rutter appeared, which were immediately attacked and destroyed by squadrons of German fighters. At 4.30, the familiar sight of prisoners, who were led to the rear under escort, came into view. At 4.44 came the report from the first battery. Direct hit in the gun, two men wounded, the gun was out of action. Visibility allows us to observe firing. Our infantry overcame the anti-tank ditches and together with the 436th Infantry Regiment created a bridgehead, supported by assault aviation. At 3.5, Russian fire from their anti-aircraft batteries became noticeably weaker. At 5.45, all fire on Baker's Point and the concentration of enemy troops at height, 50.6 ceased. At 6.25, the forward observers of the first battery opened fire on enemy tanks sighted in the front line. At 6.30, a report came that observers from the second battery had established their post at Azchaluka. At 7.45, a reconnaissance was sent to find forward observation and gun positions. From 7.55 to 11.0 forward observers from the first battery identified pockets of strong resistance in Sandy Gully, and from the firing positions of the first battery, enemy columns heading eastward were taken under fire, as well as heavy troop movements south of point 323. At 11.0, the third battery moved its positions to an area east of the anti-tank ditch. At 12.15, a report was received that our infantry had taken point 323, the Moscow stronghold. At the same time, east of point 323, the first battery took out an enemy tank. At 12.20, the headquarters of the unit settled at the new location. At 13.45, the first and second batteries also moved their positions. After that, the forward observers directed barrage fire at height 50.2, and with darkness all visibility disappeared. As we began our march into the Soviet Union, we found ourselves face to face with an unpredictable enemy whose actions, resistance or loyalty could not be foreseen or even assessed. At times we encountered the fanatical resistance of a handful of soldiers who fought to the last bullet and, even when exhausted, refused to surrender. It happened that we had an enemy in front of us who surrendered in droves, offering minimal resistance and for no clearly visible reason. When the captives were interrogated, it was found that these variables had little to do with education, place of birth or political leanings. The common peasant resisted desperately, while the trained military commander surrendered immediately upon contact with us. The next bout showed just the opposite, although there was no system or apparent reason. Up in an old copper mine near Kerch, several Red Army officers and soldiers continued to resist throughout the occupation of the peninsula. When their stronghold was depleted of water, they began licking moisture off the wet walls in an attempt to escape dehydration. Despite the brutality displayed by their opponents on the Russian front, the opposing German military developed a deep sense of respect for these survivors who refused to surrender during weeks, months and years of stubborn resistance. At the outbreak of war, we had before us a huge unstoppable force, devoid of professional command, politically purged and resurrected in communist ideology. The revolution of 1917 had led political specialists in the Soviet Union to believe that only a firm political ideology, such as that which had prevailed during the revolution, would win wars. Therefore, in the years leading up to the war, from 1937 to 1938, Stalin effectively rid the Red Army of professional military leaders, replacing them with politicians to whom he entrusted his fate. These political appointees successfully dismantled the army that had been built up since the early years of the Soviet system. 
Large armoured formations were disbanded and reorganised to use outdated cavalry tactics. Discipline was maintained more on the principle of political reliability than military efficiency. In 1941, these changes, driven by Stalinist paranoia inherent in the Bolshevik system, cost the Red Army millions of dead. The vast expanse of this country that had to be overcome, the bitterly cold winters and scorching summer months, and on top of that, the endless rains in spring and fall that turned the roads into impassable swamps. And finally, the iron fortitude of the Russian people at the gates of Moscow and Leningrad, these were what stopped our offensive. These factors gave the Soviet Union a respite in spite of the policy of self-destruction which the Soviet state was pursuing against the Red Army, and then came the turn of philosophy. The Soviet Army restored the ideology of an officer corps, replete with gold galoon epaulets and boots above the knees, in order to instill discipline, pride and respect for tradition in the active army, the old officer ranks were restored. The doctrine that had unsuccessfully tried to encourage peasants to sacrifice and fight for the communist state had to be abandoned, and everywhere the call to fight for the motherland and the fatherland began to be heard. Soon the commissars who held important positions in the Red Army were replaced by officers with military talent and merit. Such was the series of tremendous changes brought about by the despair of a few months of overwhelming successes of the German Wehrmacht. After the initial successes came the increasing difficulty of trying to maintain mobility and make up for our losses. By contrast, the Soviet Union was growing stronger. Its vast industrial capacity, for the most part evacuated under the protection of the Urals, concentrated on war production on a gigantic scale. Food and military equipment began to arrive in huge quantities, against such an overwhelming advantage in manpower and materials. The German soldiers could not resist. The Soviets adopted the tactics of the Wehrmacht, and those advantages inherent in our military system were effectively utilized by the Red Army. In contrast, the leaders in Berlin sacrificed huge numbers of soldiers to the same hold at all costs, fallacy that had nearly destroyed the Red Army in 1941. Hitler stubbornly refused to cede territory for the sake of improving the strategic situation, so the Russians with their newfound strengths could pierce thin defense lines and encircle large groups of German troops. Army leadership, given over to political appointees which had already adversely affected the fighting ability of the Soviet army, began to manifest itself on an increasingly large scale in the Wehrmacht. When confronted with trouble and military setbacks, Hitler's reliance on politically loyal officers to control unwise and sometimes absurd methods began to reflect, as in a mirror, what had been happening in Stalin's army in the years before the war. The soldiers of the Red Army were now markedly different from those we met at first. The mentality of the Russian soldier changed from apathy and indifference to patriotism. They were indoctrinated with the idea of belonging to an elite army, which alone could save the world from fascism, and began to develop a sense of pride that had long been absent from the ranks of the Soviet armed forces. The Russian soldier proved to be an extremely difficult opponent who, if properly motivated, could endure the harshest of conditions. The standard summer uniform consisted of a spacious, khaki-colored gymnast ski and pants sewn from lightweight material. In winter, a dense woolen quilted material was used, which provided excellent insulation in cold climates. Russian soldiers carried a dense overcoat with them at any time of the year, using it both as a blanket and as a uniform depending on the situation. A Russian soldier was issued boots several sizes larger than his foot, so he could stuff them with straw or paper during the harsh winter months. This served as an effective and practical defense against the grueling cold weather that killed so many of our soldiers. During the last months of the war, Red Army troops were often equipped with large Valenki boots, which had excellent insulation. Unfortunately, our boots were issued exactly to size, and on the Crimean front we considered ourselves lucky to have suffered far less from the harsh winter than the divisions on the northern sections of the front. The weapons of our opponents were simple in design but practical. In the early months of the war, the infantry units our troops encountered 
were armed with bolt-action rifles similar to our carbines. As the war progressed, we began to develop new automatic weapons with much greater rate of fire for use primarily in close combat. This tactic was also used by the Red Army and soon short-barreled automatic rifles, equipped with a high-capacity magazine, came to symbolize the Russian soldier. The Soviet soldier was a master at getting food and taking care of himself. As the war unfolded and the supply lines became longer due to Wehrmacht defeats and German withdrawals, the Red Army supplied itself mainly from the territories it occupied at the time. Armed with an automatic rifle with a voluminous magazine, dressed in uniforms appropriate to the terrain, and living on a meagre diet of what was at hand, the Russian soldier proved himself a most skillful opponent. The Wehrmacht came into the vastness of the Soviet Union with maps and intelligence that proved to be highly inaccurate. Often we try to find roads on German maps by terrain elements that did not exist in nature. A clearly marked road categorized as an improved or trunk road turned out to be a primitive country road. It became common practice to use captured Red Army maps as soon as possible. And these maps, known for their accuracy, were reproduced by regimental headquarters for our use, often with place names in both languages. The Wehrmacht and the Red Army clawing at each other fought a deadly battle for nearly four years. And during that time, the difference between the two armies, so obvious at first, began to fade. The German soldier, too, had learned the art of improvisation and out of necessity lived largely off the land as the supply system slowly collapsed. For practical reasons, and out of necessity, even the uniforms of the opponents began to resemble each other. The same can be said of weapons and tactics of combat, in the end, our trenchers more easily began to identify themselves with the enemy with whom they fought a brutal battle than with the glossy and refined army which they had long ago known in Germany. At the beginning of the war, there were cases of mass desertion from the Red Army, and many of the deserters volunteered to serve in our troops for a variety of reasons. Known to us as helpers, these servicemen had served in the Red Army before they were captured or deserted. Many of them volunteered to serve with us, wishing to escape the horrible conditions of the POW camps, far to the rear, beyond the jurisdiction of frontline troops, where they would suffer unimaginable hardship. There was a difference between those helpers who came to us from the POW camps and those who had endured starvation and forced labor under Stalin's regime and therefore had come to hate the Bolsheviks, the freedom-loving mountain people of the Caucasus. The wandering nomads of the steppes and the Crimean Tatars had been defending themselves and their way of life against the Russians for centuries. Religion also played an important role, as the Islamic Crimean Tatars fiercely defended their religious freedom. Among General Lindemann's personal belongings were several letters written by Russian helpers to their relatives, and these letters were accompanied by an official translation made by the postal censor, the postal censor the Sergeant Peter Tislike, Aliyev Namd, Field Post 17,433. Don't believe anyone who tells you anything different. For 20 years we were prisoners of the godless Soviets. We starved and labored day and night. Now we want to help the German army with all our might and from the bottom of our hearts. Almighty Allah will give us the strength to help defeat and destroy the godless enemy. May Allah help us. Satirov Vitut, PTN 27076. From now on things will go better for us than they ever did under the Soviets. A new era is coming for us Tatars. In the future we will no longer work for others but for ourselves. Nyslov said Nalil, PP no. 29787. Father, on April 4, I arrived in Crimea. It is good here. We live together with German soldiers. We eat and drink together. Every week we wash every week. The soldiers are very friendly to us and there is never a dull moment here when the officers come. They are not so arrogant but are very friendly to us. The officers are also friendly with the soldiers and the soldiers respect the officers. Soldiers are never tortured, quite the opposite. The Bolsheviks always talked about socialism. But when you compare, the Germans have socialism, not the Bolsheviks. Real socialism is in the German eye. Comradeship, equality, 
respect for each other, justice and friendship. These qualities will ensure the ultimate victory. Tater. I can tell you that on the 24th the partisans from the mountains attacked the villages of Tigan, Rayon and Carabusa. Then 60 Germans and 50 Tater volunteers came up and fought until the next morning to drive the partisans out of the area. The partisans stole cattle, sheep and horses. Kurtamnov Vazim P. No. 16,691. I live for the German army, and together we will destroy the Bolshevik enemy. I fight for the freedom of the Tatar people, and to free the Islamic religion from the Bolshevik yoke. Every Friday we go to the mosque and pray. If I survive this war, I will become a village mullah. North Nature, PP 12,963. Things are going well, don't worry about us. We are already used to this life. My German comrades are good people. Their generosity is hard to imagine after the way we lived under the Soviets. The officers here also live with us. Write me a prayer and send it to Ablamit Metshit, PN 462. The mosque is reopened and everyone goes to pray. We are living again like in the old days. Allah has blessed us again. A letter written by his wife in response to news received from an aide describes the suffering of the civilian population. Hello, my husband. Mafram, I send my greetings and wish you good health. Your son Roslak, your daughter Naja, your sister Aisha, and your niece Lemara also send their greetings. Mafram, your brother has been released and is now working in the village as a barber. We haven't received anything from the headman. Once a week we get bread. There is no money, and when we ask for help, the headman refuses. You shouldn't have gone back to the service. Please don't ask how we live. Words are nothing. We live badly. Maybe you got bored, so you left your family. Then you can live alone, because when you come back, you won't find your wife or children. We had Alex in our company, a former Soviet soldier of Caucasian descent who had been taken prisoner in combat by one of our units. He had never seen a POW camp and was our stable boy and also acted as cook. He remained a faithful and steadfast helper in the rear units until the very last days of the war. We also had many helpers coming to us from the POW camps who went to serve voluntarily. The army did everything in its power to improve the living conditions of prisoners who could not be moved to the rear from the battle zone due to lack of transportation. Our rations were reduced to feed these prisoners, and the mortality rate while they were in our custody did not exceed 2%, which is simply remarkable considering that most of the prisoners were emaciated or wounded when taken. When the Russians successfully landed at Theodosia, the capture of one camp containing 5,000 prisoners seemed imminent. The prisoners were mostly anxious to be allowed to march on Simferopol to the German defence line than to be liberated by the Soviets. The crossing was accomplished, with no need to use a convoy to prevent escape. The POWs were probably well aware of the reception that awaited them for surrendering to the German army. A number of former POWs volunteered to fight with partisan units in rear areas and proved effective in protecting important communications and transportation routes. It was once even reported that various partisan groups and bandits were engaged in open competition among themselves for control of certain areas and geographical sections, thus revealing the distinction between those organized and directly supplied by the Soviet government and those units which considered themselves independent of central authority. Partisan units also existed on the Crimean Peninsula. Operating from bases deep in the Yala Mountains, they recruited supporters from among the local population and the scattered remnants of Soviet army units. Such partisan units were prepared and well organized even before the invasion, and deep in the mountains were large, well-equipped warehouses with ammunition and food. The partisan units included many women, many of whom had lost husbands, sons, and other family members in battles with our troops early in the war. The road along the south bank was frequently attacked and at times it was necessary to lend heavy weapons to the rear columns to ensure safe passage. For the most part, the security forces were formed from Romanian troops or volunteer Tata and Cossack companies, as German troops were used to the last soldier at the front. It became the norm for the Eastern Front 
that the partisans fought brutally and without laws, posing a constant threat to any rear area. May 20, 1942, for the last 12 days, we had been marching westward through the battlefields. We passed by the Pau Pasha positions, for which there was a fierce struggle, passed the area Moscow, height 55.6, crossed anti-tank ditches, and the Anglo-Indian telegraph line. In some places, telegraph poles were split and broken. Wires were down from stumps left by the poles. The troops seized the opportunity and collected copper wires for the countless needs of the army in the field. The telegraph line began in London, stretched across the North Sea, through the Crimea, across the Caucasus and over Persia to Calcutta. Before becoming a casualty of our war, it linked two continents and served the world, especially British colonial policy, for decades. At the edge of the narrow valley we left behind the sparse, wire like grass of the steppe, and came to lush green fields surrounding a small village of clean houses. Most of these houses were built of light coloured stone and had fences. Here we were greeted by the sweet smell of flowers, and we soon learned that roses are grown in this valley, whose petals then go for sale. At the bottom of the valley we found a sea of roses stretching to the horizon. The first inhabitants in this area were natives of Romania, who settled here during the time of the Russian Empress Catherine. During the summer seasons they collected millions of petals for processing, and one gram of rose oil is obtained from a thousand petals. Under Joseph Stalin, this industry, which had largely catered to the upper classes since the days of the feudal lords, was exploited even more to bring in the revenue the Soviet state so desperately needed. In one of the past attacks on Kerch in this same area, we captured a small Russian tracked car abandoned by its previous owners in a completely untouched state. Before moving on to Kerch, we removed the alternator from it, an easy way to keep the car for ourselves for the future. After sitting over a map and scouring the area, we found our vehicle standing intact on a gentle downhill slope right where we had left it. After installing the generator and making a few adjustments, it was ready to go, and we immediately adapted it to two hour TV. The tractor was equipped with the same Ford engine that was plentiful in the captured vehicles, and in spite of the broken track, it proved to be reliable, serving us continuously for several months. Having installed on it, thanks to the Soviet Army, new units, we went forward to our last objective in the Crimea, Sevastopol. In early June 1942, the 132nd Infantry Division faced the most crucial test of the entire war. Since the recent winter fighting, the enemy had been constantly preparing and strengthening its defences and moving fresh, newly formed troops to reinforce units that had suffered heavy losses in an effort to defend the Crimean Peninsula. The Soviets, receiving strong material support from the United States, also moved huge quantities of military equipment by sea to troop concentrations. The 11th Army was obliged to take the fortress of Sevastopol, which consisted of a complex system of defences. Because if the fortress was left in Russian hands, the German divisions that were so badly needed elsewhere on the sparse eastern front would be tied to the cry. It was impossible to stop trying to take Sevastopol but it was necessary to make sure that in the future the Soviets could not use it as a bridgehead from which to launch an offensive deep into the Ukraine. And once the breakthrough into the Ukraine succeeded, the Soviets would then be able to break through the German right flank as well and possibly cut the most important communications of entire armies that were advancing eastward. From long ago, the Russians had been in complete control of the entire region with their Black Sea Fleet. So this threat loomed over the German army in the Crimea as soon as it settled on the peninsula. Regular shelling by large caliber shipboard guns from 20 kilometers off the coast became routine. And until July 1942, the Axis naval forces in the area consisted of only a small number of Italian gunboats in harbors along the Crimean coastline. The geographical position of the fortress at Sevastopol allowed it to control the entire area of the Chersonese Peninsula, equipped with numerous modern coastal batteries of heavy calibre, from which it was possible to fire at ground targets on the peninsula. 
The fortress was protected from that side also by the difficult terrain. To the north, the Belbeck Valley was a natural barrier to the front line of defence. In the east, lush shrubbery and dense forest served as a barrier to the attacking infantry, occasionally interrupted by steep gorges, ravines and hollows, often with steep impassable slopes, making it impossible to move troops in large forces. In front of the troops, who were to begin the final battle for the strongest and largest Russian fortress, there were commanding heights from which the defenders had a wide view and which created a huge problem for the attackers in breaking through deep valleys, steep gorges and dense bushes, the northern front stretching along the Belbeck Valley and including Bastion I, a battery of 305mm guns in armoured turrets Maxim Gorky and Fort Shishkova, looked particularly impressive. The Live Army Corps, skillfully commanded by Cavalry General Hansen, was assigned the task of being the first to rush to assault the fortress. It included the 132nd, 22nd, 50th and 24th Infantry Divisions. In preparation, heavy calibre batteries up to 800mm were brought up and placed to assist the attack, scheduled for June 7. For seven days prior to the offensive, a barrage of artillery fire pounded the fortified enemy positions and the Maxim Gorky battery received special attention from German gunners. The 132nd Infantry Division, stationed on the right flank of the Liv Army Corps, was tasked with launching a frontal attack across the Belbeck Valley to take Olberg and pushing southwest to gain the opportunity to assault the commanding heights of Bastion I and Maxim Gorky from the southeast. Our neighbours on the left flank, the 22nd Infantry Division, would be able to launch an attack only after we had captured the heights at Olberg. During the last days of May, the batteries of our artillery regiments were moved to new positions, which were in the northern sectors. In the following days, the rumble of countless artillery volleys could be heard in the gorges and valleys, continuously striking the enemy positions, preparing the situation for the next attack. Batteries fired day and night at scattered targets. The 5th Battery attempted to set up an observation post on the Koberberg, from which it was possible to observe the Soviet positions. Then, throughout the daylight hours, the air was filled with the ominous hum of planes from both sides, prowling for live targets, and in the distance dive bombers could be seen periodically attacking the town beneath them. With the help of artillery fire and dive bombers, enemy anti-aircraft batteries were successfully neutralised, although this cost the Luftwaffe dearly. At night, Fiesi Le Storch reconnaissance planes circled over Soviet trenches, while the Russians unsuccessfully illuminated the battle lines with searchlights, often scouring the area at an altitude high enough to spot any movement in our ground defences. These planes also helped to drown out the noise made by our motorised columns pushing toward the front line. We arrived at our positions on June 5, hastily entrenched just 100 metres from the forward Russian posts. We used a captured Russian tractor to pull the gun up to the firing position. On the way to this point we passed a heavy 600mm gun with a particularly short barrel and, after inspecting the gun, concluded that it was new to us. We were told that the gun was used on the Sevastopol front specifically against the Maxim Gorky. During firing we could see giant shells in flight, and the militia soldiers immediately dubbed them flying coffins. Our anti-tank gun was located to the right of a steep cliff, hidden in a shallow lowland opposite the fortification Maxim Gorky. All the previous night we had been cutting a shallow trench in the stony ground, the ground yielding only under the blows of heavy picks which we carried with us in our tracked vehicle. The nights were short, giving us only five or six hours of darkness, during which we could labour in relative safety, until there was danger of being seen by enemy observers hiding at a short distance from our position. Since preparations for the assault on the coast fortress were nearing completion, it was known that the fortress itself had hundreds of concrete pillboxes, bunkers, armour-protected batteries, deep trenches, barbed wire and minefields. Deep in the rocks were gun emplacements and mortar positions that could not be reached or neutralised by conventional artillery fire or airstrikes. Artillery, mines, anti-aircraft guns, and assault guns pounded the enemy's battle lines for five days before the offensive. 
1,300 cannons opened fire on pre-deployed targets and field positions. Squadrons VI Air Corps General von Richthofen mercilessly bombed the Russian line of defense. The ground burned and agonized in this deadly overture. Never before or since in the war had German forces concentrated artillery, in excess of the thousand guns used by Montgomery against the African Corps at the Battle of El Alamein. Jet mortars had a special role in the plans for the assault. The 1st Heavy Mortar Regiment, the 7th Mortar Regiment, and the 1st and 4th Mortar Batteries were assigned to a special headquarters under the command of Kurt Niman. 21 batteries opened fire with 576 guns, including the 1st Mortar Battery firing 28cm and 32cm high explosive and incendiary mines. Each salvo of this regiment fired 324 rockets toward the targets. These ramparts of fire were intended to demoralize enemy troops as well as physically destroy their defenses. And in both cases, the same positive effect was achieved. A battery of six rocket launchers could fire 26 shells, which flew with a nerve-shattering roar, producing a terrible effect. The fragments from these shells were not as impressive as those from artillery shells. But the bursting of the shell when detonated in a confined space or at close range caused blood vessels to burst from the shock wave. Enemy soldiers in close proximity to the explosion were soon demoralized by the eardrum bursting blasts, and the usual instinctive fear quickly gave way to terror and panic. Russian stoic soldiers, normally insensitive even to raids by Stukars, were often rendered helpless by such shelling. Three phenomenal artillery behemoths were sent to participate in the battles for Sevastopol. The Gamma Mortar, the Karl Mortar and the giant railroad gun Dora. All three were considered miracle weapons of conventional artillery at the time and were designed and manufactured for the special purpose of destroying reinforced concrete bunkers and fortifications. The Gamma Mortar was simply a revived Big Berta gun of World War I. It fired 427mm shells weighing 923 kilograms and had a range of 14 kilometers. The monstrously large barrel was 6.72 meters long, and the gun was operated by a team of 235 artillerymen. For all its enormity, the Gamma gun was dwarfed by the 600mm Karl or Tor mortar. Designed to destroy concrete pillboxes, it fired 2,200 kilogram shells that bore little resemblance to conventional mortars. Its five-meter barrel and gigantic carriage gave the impression of some kind of factory on wheels, flaunting a huge pipe that loomed at an angle against the sky. Yet the Karl was not the perfect model of artillery produced by our technology. The greatest gun was installed in Bakhchisarai in the Palace of Gardens, the old residence of the Tatar Khan, and was christened Dora. The frontline soldiers nicknamed it Heavy Gustav, and with its 800mm calibre it remained the heaviest gun of the war. Sixty railroad cars were required to transport its individual components, which were then assembled on site to put the gun into action. The 32.5 meter long barrel fired high explosive shells weighing 4,800 kilograms, or nearly five tons. The projectile and cartridge case were 7.8 meters long. In the vertical position, the projectile was as tall as a two-story house. The maximum rate of fire was three rounds per hour. It was constantly guarded by two anti-aircraft batteries. The gun crew, additional guards, and maintenance personnel of this monster were headed by a major general, a colonel, and numbered 1,500 men. This dilapidated military philosophy relied on traditional artillery elements in a perverse, gigantic form that had grown so large as to be counterproductive in terms of the manpower and material costs required to maintain and utilize them. Nevertheless, it was reported that a single shell from a Dora penetrated a 30-meter layer of earth and destroyed a huge underground arsenal in the northern bay near Sevastopol. In the depths behind the forward positions in convenient locations and protected by terrain conditions, the Soviets, awaiting the arrival of the attackers, were painstakingly working on their defensive lines. The fortress was defended by seven Soviet rifle divisions, a hastened cavalry division, two rifle brigades, three naval brigades, 
two regiments of marines, separate tank battalions and individual units, totaling over 100,000 men. In the defensive order were 10 artillery regiments and mortar divisions, an anti-tank regiment, as well as 45 batteries of heavy coastal artillery, totaling 500 guns and 2,000 mortars. These troops represented a defense of monstrous power, which had to be passed, captured, or destroyed by the forces of the 11th Army, which had only seven weakened German divisions and two poorly armed Romanian divisions. On the evening of June 6, we assembled at the headquarters of I Battalion, 436 Regiment, where we were briefed that the assault would begin tomorrow morning at 3.5 a.m. My gun crew was to suppress with fire a Soviet fortification just to the left of our position and slightly higher in elevation. The target was clearly visible at a distance of 300 meters from our position. We spent the night curled up under cloaked tents in narrow trenches dug behind our gun. At an early morning hour, when everything was still plunged into darkness, we climbed out of our hiding places, leaving the warmth of our hastily chipped shelters, and in the bracing night air began to prepare to begin our firing raid at exactly 3.5. A few minutes later, I noticed a red rocket floating to the ground through the smoke and darkness to our left, a signal to us that the forward assaulting units had gone on the attack. I adjusted my fire accordingly so as not to hit my own troops rushing forward toward the enemy positions. Despite the coming daylight hours, visibility continued to deteriorate as smoke and dust clouds covered our targets. The angry enemy had already awakened, and we found ourselves under direct fire from the Maxim Gorky battery. Shells of all calibers, including naval artillery from warships, began to tear around us. Not being able to respond, we could only sit huddled in our shallow trenches, praying to survive and wait out this barrage. Countless bursts surrounded and seemed to engulf our guns, and the air was filled with shrapnel hissing and whistling overhead. A hail of stones and clods of earth rained down upon us as huge shells exploded near us, throwing upward black-brown geysers, driving us from fear into a daze. The ground trembled, our eyes were full of dust, and it became difficult to breathe. We lay motionless, pressed against the walls of the trenches, while rocks and dirt poured down our grey-green helmets. With hands struggling to cover our ears, we clenched our eyelids tightly with all our might, hopelessly trying to ward off the sudden terror that had descended upon us. One of the artillerymen in my squad, who had fought bravely in previous battles, suddenly rushed to the far corner of our trench, tore off his helmet and shouted, drowning out the roar of the explosion. Hey, I can't take it any more. With foaming at the mouth and eyes wide open with horror, he jumped up, struggling to get out of the trench. When another shell exploded near the edge of our embankment, sending red-hot shrapnel whistling around, I threw my whole weight on top of him and threw him to the ground. Splitting his teeth, scratching and struggling frantically, he tried to break free. Quickly rising to my feet, I slapped him across the face and came at him again. He lay motionless, staring at me with wide open eyes, and I released him to seek safety at the edge of the trench. But suddenly, as if he had gone mad, he sprang over the barrier in one fell swoop, ran headlong through the clouds of smoke and dust, and disappeared in the rear. We again rushed for cover as the hail of shells intensified, and did not expect to see him alive as we huddled on the ground, trying to escape the bursts and fragments of shells. Then, that same evening, when the guns fell silent, he again appeared at the position as if nothing had happened, and this incident was never recalled afterwards. The 5th Company of the 437th Infantry Regiment broke through the enemy's defences near a rock on the north side of the Belbeck Valley. Fortified by the enemy, turned by him into a powerful defensive point, gorges with steep walls provided the enemy with protection from our artillery fire. My friend Fritz, whom I had known from the time of joint conscript training in Darmstadt, was lying with his group at a staging point near a cliff. He pulled a hand grenade from behind his belt, pulled the pin and tossed it into the enemy trench in front of him. At the same moment a Russian infantryman gave a line from a machine gun and a bursting bullet pierced Fritz's arm, 
he lost consciousness. The soldiers beside him rushed forward through the smoke and dust, coming to his senses. Fritz crawled back to the rear to report on the breakthrough of the enemy defences. His grenade killed an enemy adjuster, allowing the infantrymen in grey-green uniforms to take advantage of a small gap in the Soviet defences and advance rapidly, breaking through the enemy defensive lines. Success in our sector resulted in gaining a few hundred metres. And further to the left, our infantry company was able to overcome the forward lines of the Belbeck Valley defences. On the afternoon of June 7, an attack along the entire front along the Belbeck Valley led to the capture of Olberg, resulting in heavy losses for our troops. Despite this, we joined up with the 22nd Infantry Division and began to prepare for a further sieve. From June 8 to June 15, the regiment continued to push forward in battles that cost us dearly, with fierce fighting took every metre on the way to capture the dominant Newhouse Heights. During this period, the 213th Infantry Regiment was ordered to go to reinforce this division and engaged on the right flank. The Russians made numerous unsuccessful attempts to break through on this wing in an effort to recapture Olberg. A major offensive was scheduled for June 17. Artillery batteries were assigned new targets and from the front could be seen bursting shells in some pockets of enemy resistance. At 7.45, the news reached us that our infantry had taken the stronghold of the GPU. At 8.30, it was reported that German troops captured the forts Siberia and Volga. After an hour of fierce fighting, our infantry broke through the line of defence arranged between primitive dwellings near Bastion I, and at 8.45, this bastion was taken by assault squads. At 10.0, also, the enemy batteries stationed in positions near Bartinievka were forced to silence. At 12.0, our advanced assault groups continued to hold the bastion, repelling powerful enemy counterattacks. Between 12.50 and 13.15, each battery of our artillery regiment fired 80 shells on Shishkova, and still these positions were staunchly defended by the Soviet infantry, who refused to give up even an inch of ground. Militia soldiers, trying to hold the bastion, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat during desperate Soviet counterattacks, and the battle rolled back and forth. We took positions, gave and retook them. The positions were strewn with the bodies of the dead, and uh, the walking wounded wandered about, staggering, unable to make sense of the smoke that engulfed the trenches. The enemy squads mingled inseparably in the fray, firing at each other, beating each other with rifle butts and stabbing each other with bayonets. At 2.5 p.m. came the report that Fort Minotov had been taken by our troops. The 641st Heavy Artillery Division was ordered to destroy the Fort Maxim Gorky. I, by the fire of two 350mm mortars located four kilometres west of Olberg. Their massive shells, weighing 1,000 kilograms each, were delivered to the breach of the guns by cranes. Mortars had been used earlier in the French campaign against the Luttich defence. The shells were designed not to explode on impact and were fitted with delayed action fuses that were triggered after the shell pierced the concrete wall of the fort. Shortly after the first shells flew from the barrels, a report came in from observers that the fort's dome had come off its base. Maxim Gorky has been punctured through and through. The 305mm shells stored inside this huge Russian battery began to explode, sending huge shrapnel into the sky at breakneck speed. Finally, the battery fell silent under cover of a cloud of dust and smoke. Sappers and infantry units stormed the hill. Inside the concrete colossus, which was 300 metres long and 40 metres wide, its defenders continued their stubborn resistance. When the fall of the fortification seemed inevitable, some defenders made a desperate attempt to break through the encirclement in separate groups. The sappers broke through the defences with explosive charges, flamethrowers and smoke bombs. After the first burst, the Soviets continued to shoot back from embrasures and gaps in the concrete, but a second explosion tore out part of the wall. A huge cavern was exposed in front of the sappers, exposing in detail the complexity of the fortress structure. Maxim Gorky went down three floors. It was an autonomous city with its own water and power supply, hospital, canteen and engine rooms, 
ammunition supply, arsenals and machine tools. All rooms and all entrances were fenced with double steel doors, and to get inside, it was necessary to open each door with explosive charges. Slowly making their way into the bowels of the concrete labyrinth, the sappers every time pressed against the walls, waiting for explosions. As soon as an explosion tore off another door, they immediately threw hand grenades into the smoking gap and then waited a short time for the smoke to clear. Along the passageways lay dead enemies mingled in disorder in the darkness and confusion, and this horrible scene was made all the more unnatural by the sight of gas masks worn by the already dead and dying. Hand grenades continued to explode in deafening proximity. Pistol shots crackled in the confined spaces. The attackers who burst into the compartment were met by the rumble of another set of steel doors closing, and everything started all over again, and this went on for hour after hour until the assault squads penetrated deep into the fortress and approached the command post. The Soviet Naval Command ordered the defenders to fight to the last man no surrender. The enemy radio operator transmitted to Vice Admiral Oak Tyabersky in a bunker near Sevastopol Harbor. The Germans are pounding on the door, demanding our surrender. We are no longer able to open the flaps to fire. There are only 46 of us left. Half an hour later, the Russians sent another radiogram. We have 22 men left. We are preparing to blow ourselves up and cut off communication. Goodbye. So the end had come. The heart of the fortress destroyed itself when the enemy was at the door, and the battle for Fort Maxim Gorky, I was over. Of the entire force of more than a thousand defenders, only forty men were captured with wounds too severe to continue resistance. The fortress Maxim Gorky fell at 16.45. With the capture of this mighty battery, the most powerful enemy fortress on the northern front of Sevastopol was in our hands. The backbone of the enemy defence was broken, and this evening our most advanced unit stood on the position of Shishkov. During the daytime, visibility on the battlefield was often impaired by bombing raids by our, our aviation. The observation post of the 1st Artillery Battalion was at a height of 200 metres east of the anti-tank ditch. The 3rd Battery changed positions, and at about 6-0 was again ready for battle northeast of Neuhaus Heights. While at Olberg, I spotted a Junkers 88 which had been badly damaged after coming under fire from an enemy anti-aircraft battery. One of its engines was engulfed in flames, and the airplane was slowly descending in circles in a northerly direction, streaking its course in the sky with a black plume of smoke. While the airplane was still over enemy territory, it seemed to me that an object fell out of its tail and flew a short distance. Suddenly, a white dot appeared in the sky, growing in size until it became possible to see a white parachute, which was gently carried to the ground. It grew larger by the second until it was clear that it was coming straight down on us. The wind carried the pilot toward us, but enemy anti-aircraft batteries and Soviet infantrymen opened fire on the slowly descending parachutist. Two of our machine gun crews rushed to the gun, and began emptying ribbon after ribbon in the direction of the Russian positions in an effort to suppress enemy fire. Directed by the forward observers, we opened fire from the ATP on the enemy positions with brisant shells, and mortars began firing after this, adding to the rumble as the pilot descended from the sky. With our fire, we silenced the enemy guns for 20 to 30 seconds before the parachute bobbed over our position and the pilot landed safely behind our trenches on a bullet-riddled parachute. Several soldiers rushed to the spot and helped him to his feet, breathing heavily. He thanked us in between gasps and reassured his rescuers that he was uninjured, but incredibly happy that he had managed to survive the gruesome ordeal and avoid capture, because the Russians were sitting in their trenches only 100 metres away. On another occasion, one of our officers, recently transferred to the company as a replacement, claimed to have been a professional dancer before he was drafted. He took great pride in his physical fitness and poise, and always conducted himself with extreme caution, taking care not to injure himself or expose himself unnecessarily. One afternoon a shell fragment cut off a noticeable part of his nose, and while I was dressing his wound he declared his intention to seek a state disability pension, 
because he was sure that with such a disfigured face his career as a dancer was over. We rarely encountered such cases when those who had just arrived at the front would secretly crawl along the embankments, sticking their hands out above the top edge of the barrier in the hope of earning a leave of absence from the front due to their wounds. In such an environment, solid, reliable citizens sometimes behaved in unpredictable and strange ways, acquiring reputations that would be unthinkable in normal life. The ranks of the infantry companies were getting thinner and thinner. During the day we were exhausted from the heat and stifling heat, and the nights brought little relief. We survived only on cigarettes, cold coffee, tea, and the meagre combat rations that were issued daily to those in the front lines. There was nothing to think about washing or shaving regularly. The chalky soil absorbed any rain moisture like a sponge, and where clear streams had run in the winter months, there were now only completely dry beds of hardened, red-brown cracked clay. The demands placed on the soldiers in the front-line trenches reached inhuman levels. In many cases, we with our ATP could not engage the enemy because of the horrible terrain, impassable to all but the infantry, who could barely make their way forward on foot. Almost all Soviet trenches and defences had to be taken separately by infantry and sappers, who slowly made their way through terrain riddled with ravines, densely overgrown with bushes and permeated with the threat of exploding enemy mines. A battle would ensue with the enemy. The position would be taken with casualties to both sides, and the soldiers would storm the next objective. I was assigned to defend the road leading to the Mackenzie of Mountains behind Newhouse Heights. During the hours of darkness when forward movement was temporarily suspended, we helped the infantry platoons to hoard ammunition and carry the wounded to the rear. On the night of June 1617, while at the headquarters of the I.I. Battalion, 437th Regiment, I saw Hauptmann Bernhardt for the last time. The next day he was killed in action while storming a position west of Newhouse Heights. The dead on both sides lay in great numbers in the ravines, and because of the danger of enemy sniper fire they could not be removed for burial. Soon the stifling heat was joined by the sickeningly sweet odour of decomposing flesh, and in only a few days the corpses were bloated to such an extent that the seams of their uniforms began to tear. The faces and arms of the dead had turned black. Their hands stretched motionless into the sky, giving the corpses an even more gruesome appearance. An army corpsman scurried between the trenches, sprinkling chlorine on the corpses in a valiant attempt to stifle the stench and delay the outbreak of infectious disease, despite living under the constant threat of death for many months. I could never pass the ravines on the leeward side without nausea coming to my throat. On June 19 and 20, our infantry regiments were withdrawn from their fighting positions as the units became unfit. With only two field officers left in one company, few soldiers survived and many company commanders were killed or wounded, with no replacements. Forward artillery observers also suffered heavy losses, and many artillerymen were killed by the return fire of the highly effective Russian artillery. To this steady decline in numbers must be added the losses among the liaison officers, sappers and scouts of the 132nd Reconnaissance Battalion. At night the hum of the Po II continued without interruption, and often we were inundated with leaflets printed in a clumsy attempt to entice soldiers to desert. One Soviet leaflet of June 1942 insinuated the following. Read it and pass it on to your comrades. Soldiers of the 50th, 24th, 132nd, 170th, 72nd and 28th Peixoto Divisions. For seven months your Supreme Command has been trying to take Sevastopol. This attempt has cost you 80,000 dead, but the goal has not been reached. And it will not be achieved. In four days alone, your June offensive on the heights of 64.4, 192.0. 104.5 and in other areas of Sevastopol cost you 14,000 men killed, wounded or missing, and you still have not succeeded in breaking through the Russian defences. And you will not succeed. The Russian sailors and guardsmen will still defend their homes and continue to dot the approaches to the city with the graves of their enemies. German soldiers. 
while your blood continues to pour in torrents from the heights of Sebastopol, your cities of home are being raided daily by heavy British bombers. Cologne, Bremen, Emden, Rostock, Lübeck and other German cities are turning into piles of smoking ruins. In a few days, Anglo-American troops will land on the continent, and the Second Front and Europe will be deployed. Marshal Timoshenko's troops continue to deliver devastating blows to Hitler's army in the southern sector, and soon the day will come when the only escape route from the Crimean Peninsula will be blocked. But for you there will be no road of retreat, either senseless destruction and death for the sake of Hitler's criminal and inhuman policy, or surrender to the defenders of Sevastopol to save your lives. Soldiers of the 11th German Army refuse to participate in any further attacks. Desert from the forward positions, surrender and you will save your lives. Supreme Command of the Red Army On June 18, the 436th Infantry Regiment took up positions in the northern part of the Shishka Fortress and the 437th Infantry Regiment recaptured the southwestern outskirts of Bartonevka. This regiment, which suffered heavy losses in personnel, was withdrawn from the front line and attached to the 46th Infantry Division to guard the coast of the Kerch Peninsula. On June 19, the fortress was taken completely, and the 97th Infantry Regiment advanced further to the southwest of it. On June 20, the Lenin stronghold fell under the attacks of this regiment, and the next day the entire chain of batteries was in the hands of the 97th Division. After this success, North Bay was in the power of the 132nd Infantry Division. After accomplishing its combat mission in the area north of North Bay, the division was ordered to move to the left flank of the Loniev Army Corps and strike southward through rugged terrain toward Gaetana. The division headquarters, formerly located at the Sailor's House, was moved to Serpentine and on June 22 to the Meltzer Gap north of Kamishi. The 436th Infantry Regiment, due to heavy losses, was removed from the front line and moved to the Kerch Peninsula for coastal defence. It was replaced by the 72nd Infantry Regiment. By June 27, the attacking units successfully overcame the area of dense bushes and after fierce fighting with enemy infantry captured the heights of Gaitatana. Then they turned to the left by 90 degrees in order to capture the hill long. After this manoeuvre, the division's battle orders spread from east to west along the eastern bank of the Shania River. The neighbour on the right was the 50th Infantry Division, and on the left was the 4th Romanian Mountain Division. On June 27, the division headquarters was moved northwest to Cherkskerman. On June 29, the offensive was again scheduled, in which troops of the Liv and XX Army Corps took part. From the headquarters of the advanced division on the bastion, I could observe the course of the attack through Chennai, overcoming stubborn enemy resistance. The German infantry was able to seize the heights with steep slopes to the west of Chennai. With good visibility before observers was an impressive sight of advancing infantry supported by assault guns and sapers, and from this point could be seen fleeing Russians who were hit by howitzer fire and their motorised units were taking damage from the Stukas raids. The day of June 30 brought new gains in battles against weakening enemy defences, and by noon individual units of the division had made their way to the southern approaches to Sevastopol. After this addition to the territory, the division headquarters moved to South Inkerman. On July 1 at 12 the quail. 30 the besieged city was subjected to artillery fire. It was planned that the main forces of the Liv Army Corps would take the eastern sector and the 132nd Infantry Division was ordered to strike at the city's defences from the south and capture the southern sector. The goal of the offensive from the south was to take the southern third of Sevastopol on the first day and the rest of the city on the second. At 9.0 from the division headquarters, now located at height 73.0, we saw the Luftwaffe shelling and bombing. The whole town seemed to have disappeared under a thick blanket of smoke and dust. In case weak resistance was encountered, the division commander requested the go-ahead to advance to the south end of the harbour through the centre of the city, which would allow the city to be taken in one day.
This contingency plan was approved. The plan of attack directed the 42nd Infantry Regiment to advance on the right flank with the 72nd Infantry Regiment in the centre, and the left flank, covering the western approaches to Sevastopol, was given to the 97th Infantry Regiment. At 12.30 p.m., it became apparent that the advanced infantry units were cracking the outer defences of the city, and the artillery fire on the southern sector was stopped so as not to cover our own troops. At 13.13, while the infantry met little or no resistance and advanced rapidly, the Reich battle standard was raised over the panorama heights dominating the city. At 1400, the division commander received a report from the commander of the 42nd Infantry Regiment, Hubert Meisel, that his troops had broken through the enemy defences, were advancing through the city and had reached artillery harbour. Upon receipt of this report, the city was officially in our hands. This report was relayed to the corps commander, immediately certified, and transmitted for special notification via German radio. At precisely 21.0, the world was informed that German troops had taken Sevastopol. The division commander Tanoda Oberst Meisel with the title the first German commander of Sevastopol. German troops pushed forward through the centre of the city, most of which lay in ruins. In many areas the flames from burning buildings and broken gas lines were so intense that it was difficult even to drive through the devastated streets. On the elevated places of the height panorama, dominating over the bay, stood a memorial to Count Total Ben, the defender of the city during the Crimean War of 1853-1856, although it was damaged by artillery fire, from which the head of the monument was blown off. The division dismantled it and sent it to Berlin to be displayed as a trophy in the Zeichhaus. The people of the city slowly crawled out of cellars cellars and underground shelters to greet their conquerors, anxious to see the German troops moving at a snail's pace in long columns through the ruins. The survivors immediately rushed to loot food stores that had escaped destruction by artillery fire. To restore order in the exhausted city, martial law was imposed as soon as possible. Food stores and the city's most important life support centers were taken under guard. In an attempt to rebuild life after the devastation that had befallen their world in the past weeks, work squads were set up in the city. After weeks of heavy fighting and brutal losses, Russia's most powerful land and coastal fortress fell firmly into German hands. Over the next few days, soldiers and Soviet prisoners of war were busy burying the thousands of dead Russians still lying everywhere in places where hard fighting had taken place. In some places, fanatical resistance was put up. During the storming of Inkerman, a huge storehouse of war material was discovered nestled in the rock. The huge facility had housed a factory for making and bottling Crimean wine before the war, and the Soviets had housed thousands of wounded soldiers and civilians seeking refuge in this massive complex to protect them. As the German troops approached, the explosive charges previously placed at the base of the cliff detonated. With a thunderous rumble, a 30-meter wall 300 meters long collapsed, sealing the entrance and burying everyone inside under a multi-ton mass of earth. Among the victims were soldiers of the German reconnaissance group who had approached the structure and had already reached the entrance when the charges exploded. The merciless sun was burning Sevastopol, with each sunrise bringing exhausting heat. The city had suffered terrible destruction from prolonged bombardment and artillery fire, but even through the ruins the beauty that had reigned here before was visible. After the devastation of the Crimean War, the Tsar rebuilt the city in the late classical style in the 1860s. Many of the impressive facades of the houses survived the war and still towered in their exquisite beauty. Port facilities were destroyed and half-sunken ships lay in the water. Either bow or stern sticking out above the surface of the water, littered with debris and covered with oil. Fires raged all around and in the streets Russian prisoners were digging passages in the ruins. The battle for the Crimea was by no means over. The Soviet army had lost Sevastopol, but most of its forces had slipped to new positions west of the city on the Chersonese Peninsula. Under Stalin's orders, if evacuation became impossible, 
they were to fight to the last man on these lines. Torpedo boats successfully evacuated a small number of high-ranking commanders and commissars, including the former commander of the defense of Sevastopol, General Petrov. Heavy fighting on the Chersonese Peninsula took place until July 4, 1942. Russian troops continued their attempts to break through the German front, seeking to link up with partisan units in the Yala Mountains. In large groups with hands mutually linked to prevent cowards from leaving the ranks and retreating, waves of attackers rolled into our trenches just as it had happened in the Mackenzie Mountains. Among the suicidal attackers were many women and Komsomol girls. These poorly trained troops suffered extremely high casualties, and the last remaining group surrendered on July 4 after an unsuccessful attempt to avoid encirclement through ravines and narrow gorges. On the Chersonese Peninsula alone, 30,000 men were taken prisoner during a combing operation. In the defeated city there remained a serious danger of disease because myriads of flies covered the corpses and formed black and grey circling clouds over the wounded. The walls of the dwellings were covered with disease-carrying insects, and eating became tedious because we had to clean every morsel of food from the hordes of worms. Although we tried to avoid eating these insects, many flies were eaten with no apparent ill effects. Even in times of peace, the plague, brought to Crimea by ship from Constantinople and the Caucasian ports, ravaged the city. During our own siege, rats, the carriers of the bacilli, proliferated, but fortunately the disease was contained. Without warning or explanation, soon millions of flies died of some epidemic that swept the neighborhood, and the flying worms were mysteriously exterminated. The English cemetery served as a memorial to the Crimean War of 1853-1856. The Soviets used the site as a command center, and the marble monuments erected to honor fallen British soldiers were destroyed and scattered amidst the remains of the dead thrown from their graves by artillery shelling. Many wounded Russians lay among the vineyards under the merciless scorching sun. Deprived of the opportunity to quench their thirst, they awaited death in the open. It became necessary for the German medical staff to try to save them, and Russian doctors and nurses were brought in from the POW camps to help scour the hills for wounded Russian soldiers. The Russian doctors had to work hard to convince the lightly wounded patients to go to the medical stations. Sometimes they had to resort to using stakes pulled out of the ground in the vineyards to force the wounded to move in the direction of the medical stations. Tiredly leaning on each other, dotted with flies and bandaged with bloody bandages, the wounded, stumbling, in pairs or small groups, slowly wandered in the direction indicated. Soon the long, pitiless columns began to make their way under the blazing sun to the wells and prisoner of war pens, and for many the journey was to be their last. After the fall of that city, the division was assigned guard duty on the Kerch Peninsula, where we remained until orders came on August 27, 1942, to redeploy northward. On the sea coast, from where the Caucasus Mountains were clearly visible, the division was able to return to relative luxury after months of deadly fighting. There it was possible to swim and rest in an organized manner, which was occasionally interrupted by guard duty and training. Yalta, on the south coast of Crimea, often referred to as the Russian Riviera, provided a place for recreation. Here, in the warmth of the summer sun and away from the bursts of shells and the crackle of sniper rifle shots, Soldiers could sit for hours playing two years later in this pleasant town. Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin would stage a conference that would determine the fates of millions. The ban on furloughs was lifted and a certain number of soldiers were allowed to take advantage of a well-deserved absence from the front. I was delighted to learn that I, too, had been selected for this respite, and I was soon on a crowded furlough train bound for Germany. After the vacation, I returned to the regimental headquarters in Kerch. There, I was informed that because of my participation in the battles, in which I destroyed three Soviet tanks, I was recommended to be sent to a military school as a candidate for the rank of officer. Those carefree days in Yalta proved to be short-lived. The movement of the German race to the east and the victories of the eastern gods had reached their zenith, or so the propagandists claimed.
propaganda units announced that at last the dream, the idea of world domination, was now becoming a reality. But here the victorious Eastern warriors took a breather from the sterile environment at the front. They went to their native places, where they became acquainted with rumours of dubious actions carried out by the Reich, and sometimes fantastic stories about politics and politicians began to float far behind the front line in the occupied territories. Often soldiers returned to the front disgruntled, and sometimes disillusioned as they began to realize that their war experience had changed them forever. They realized that they would no longer feel free in Germany, that the friends and comrades in their combat units had become their family, that war had become their life. In the summer of 1942, the German armies pushed forward from the Don and Cuban to the Caucasus. They reached the shores of the Caspian Sea and the banks of the Volga. The name Stalingrad began to be spoken frequently, and there was no hint of what the future held for the 6th Army on the Volga. The original plan was for the 11th Army to cross the Kerch Strait, make its way to the Caucasus, and turn north to launch the intended offensive in coordination with the German southern flank. Hitler, the man who led our command in Berlin, now sometimes referred to as the greatest commander of all time, changed this plan. The capture of Sevastopol by divisions of the 11th Army gave rise in Hitler to the idea of using these divisions in the assault on Leningrad. Thus was set in motion an absurd plan aimed at removing the main force of Crimean divisions from the southernmost point of the German advance and transferring them to the northernmost part of Russia. The dire need to anchor these troops on the southern flank of the Eastern Front was ignored. Who knows, maybe the 6th Army could have avoided its fate in Stalingrad if the experienced Crimean divisions had remained on the southern flank. It was nearing the end of August, and most of the 11th Army had already left its positions on the Kerch Peninsula. The various units of the division loaded onto echelons for the long journey north and spent an average of 8 to 10 days on the road until they landed on the Leningrad front. The division was manned and ready for combat by mid-September. There were rumours that we were to storm Leningrad. In the summer of 1941, with the addition of newly arrived divisions, it was still possible to take the city. But then it was thought that the population of Leningrad would starve to death and surrender, thus sparing the Wehrmacht many casualties. The Russians showed exceptional courage and unfailing fortitude in proving this idea wrong and they were able to supply the city in summer by ship, and in winter by means of a railroad laid across the thick ice of Lake Ladoga. Although many thousands starved to death in the besieged city, the Russian people survived the ordeal and held the front. For the German side, Leningrad became a costly war of attrition, a stalemate that siphoned off our dwindling reserves. The enemy quickly realized that he had new divisions in front of him on the Leningrad front. The Soviets immediately launched an attack on our positions in an attempt to break the blockade from the land, and by this attack the Russians thwarted the offensive plan for the capture of the city. Instead of engaging in a final battle to capture Leningrad, the Crimean divisions were forced to eliminate the deep Russian breakthrough, to engage in an operation that developed into an open battle on the southern shore of Lake Ladoga. The drop-shaped bulge stretched along the front about 8 kilometers wide and 12 kilometers deep into the German defense line where it was held by the 18th Army. A counter-attack was planned to hit the bulge from the south, and our 132nd Infantry Division was sent into action with the mission of attacking north and making our way to Gatorlov. We were to seal the ledge to the west to prevent attempts to break out of it and to create a new line of defense to the east as protection against further attacks on our flank. On the morning of September 5, the forward units were able to make their way to Tosno. The enemy made attacks in large forces at the eastern end of the narrow corridor east of Mijie and managed to break through in several places. These breakthroughs were repulsed by newly arrived divisions from the Crimea, with the 132nd Infantry Division remaining in reserve and concentrated in the area of MGAAA, Sublino, Shup. And the next day the situation changed and the division was again subordinated to the 11th Army. On September 8, parts of the 436th Infantry Regiment 
and I Battalion of the 132nd Artillery Regiment were moved to the front line. Every other day an average of 7 to 10 echelons were loaded, and by the evening of September 16 the division was fully prepared to fight the enemy. Meanwhile the enemy breakthrough was stopped in the area of Miji, and then the breakthrough troops were blocked by a blow from the north and south, resulting in the Soviet units were taken in pincers, which closed in the area Gaitolov. At first, the attacks of the 170th and 24th Infantry Divisions had little success, and the 132nd Division was brought into the battle in the direction of Sologubovka Gay, NGA, on almost impassable roads reached their areas of concentration from September 17 to 19. Each movement required incredible efforts. Dugouts and defensive positions were located in swamps, where there was almost nowhere to hide, and the troops were constantly exposed to soaked ground and sticky cold air. Winter uniforms were still in short supply, and troops suffered from the cold that descended on the shivering infantrymen each night. The order to prepare for the offensive was received on September 21. It was necessary to march all night along a road made of roughly hewn logs to reach the original areas, and again the advance was seriously hampered by narrow muddy passages through impenetrable woods. It was not until after dawn that the regiments finally reached their destination, Apraxin. At 8.0 the Chief of Staff gave a final briefing. The distance from the Bivazi to the site of the attack was only two kilometers, but due to poor roads and terrain conditions, the transition took more than two hours. The attack was scheduled to begin at 12 at noon, and the 436th and 437th regiments immediately became aware that the attack would not take place at the appointed time and was unlikely to be possible before 14.0. Headquarters rearranged the schedule as far as possible, moving the attack to 13.0. Despite their best efforts, the soldiers were unable to keep to the schedule and the attack was again delayed. The fact that the attack on Shania took place at all must be attributed to the personal efforts of the soldiers. And the inevitable failure of our troops, who were unable to advance northward and capture more territory, can only be attributed to the lack of time to prepare for the attack. Because of poor preparation, casualties in this attack were unusually high. On September 22, 510 men in the regiments were killed in action, including seven officers, while another eight officers were wounded and one was missing. The strength of the four battalions fell to a thousand men in all, indicating that the first attack on Shania cost our troops 30% casualties. On September 23, a new attack was scheduled for Tenzio. The tanks and assault guns assigned in support quickly became stuck in the swampy terrain and were unable to cross the Shania to operate on its other bank. Because of the impassable terrain and poor communications between regiment and battalions, the few morning hours again proved insufficient to prepare for the attack, and after advancing some hundred metres, the troops reported that they were unable to push forward. Three hours later, at 1300 hours, the attack was ordered to be repeated. A dash through the densely overgrown swampy terrain to Gaitolov should be made at any cost, but again the attack failed. At 15.30, under strong artillery cover, the attack was again attempted. The artillery fire was intense, as all corps and division batteries kept up a continuous fire for 30 minutes, completely covering the area along the length of the attack section. In spite of this expenditure of our last supplies, the weakened troops suffered two heavy losses and were too exhausted to make headway. The attack was again stalled. On September 25, under the direction of the battalion commander, an attack was launched that broke a gap in the Soviet defences and allowed us to link up with units to the north near Gaitolov. At 12.30pm, the battalion entered Gaitolovo. Hauptmann Schmidt, the battalion commander accomplished this feat by combining his exceptional command qualities with personal bravery in the face of superior enemy forces. For this feat he was presented for the Knight's Cross, and on October 8 he received this highly prized award. The capture of Gaitolov gave rise to a feeling in our ranks that once again we are able to almost any feat required of us. 
it was widely believed that there were no undefeated enemy units left between the division and the forward units of the 437th Regiment. However, on September 25, the enemy managed to break a bulge between the right flank of the regiment and the 436th Infantry Regiment, and this gap could not be closed because of the weakness of the 436th Regiment. By this time, the division could no longer be given further combat missions, for the troops had reached a point of exhaustion at which no further operations were conceivable. The Soviets were evidently in the same situation, and in spite of all attempts to recapture the two kilometers held by our regiment, they failed. On September 26, the division received a new order to attack. It was ordered to push back the enemy behind Chennai and hold this sector in order to create a bridgehead from where our troops could patch up any breach punctured in our front. Once again, the weakened units were unable to accomplish their tasks against a deeply entrenched enemy. On September 27 another attempt was made, and the 437th Infantry Regiment succeeded in reaching the former Russian command post 500 metres east of the bridge over the Shania. There our soldiers entrenched themselves and waited for the inevitable counterattack. Without the support of its neighbours, the regiment was unable to prevent the Soviets from slipping past it to the west. The regiment continued to hold its ground against the powerful Soviet forces while Russian units streamlined this island of resistance and attacked the German positions. On September 30, the 3rd Mountain Division launched an offensive that breathed hope into the Beleard 437th Regiment, restored the front line on the flanks, and prevented the regiment's encirclement. The losses sustained during these days were exceptionally heavy, to the extent that the regiment had strength only to hold its defences. To break through even a minor Russian defence, we had no strength. Officially from October 5, the regiment was on the defensive, and on October 11 came the order to replace it with units of the 24th Infantry Division. The exhausted troops handed over their positions to the approaching units and went to the rear to rest in the Vyritsa area. During the battles at Gatorloth, our divisional Catholic priest earned the name of the priest with the knapsack. He was always on the move, carrying his worn-out knapsack on straps behind his back, in which he used to deliver to the soldiers at the most advanced posts simple foodstuffs, which were considered a luxury there. He was always ready to help the wounded, and once personally found and rescued a badly wounded soldier who had been hit by a sniper's bullet in an open section of the front. His constant exposure to frontline and physical danger for the sake of the soldiers brought him to an untimely end when he was seriously wounded by shrapnel in his arm. The result of Russian mortar fire from a dense forest a few hundred meters away. The wound was so serious that it required amputation. Thus, the division lost a valuable soldier and com The division commander attempted to formally recognize his many brave deeds and devotion by submitting him for an award. But this submission was rejected in light of the typically national socialist philosophy, which refused to confer such a high honor unless the priest agreed to give up his soutane. Between September 22 and October 7, our battalion lost a total of 62 men killed, 280 wounded, and 30 missing. About 20, 30 lightly wounded and sick remained with the battalion, so that the battalion's fighting strength was about 50 men. During the short rest at Vyritsa from October to December, emergency measures were taken to restore the regiment's fighting strength. In search of replacements suitable for infantry service, rear units, sapper platoons, transport and other units considered not so important were combed. The desperate fighting that had recently taken place south of Lake Ladoga had come at a heavy price, and there were no other sources for replenishment. Until October 28, when the order came to redeploy to a new sector of the Eastern Front in the SAC area near Pogosti, our homegrown reinforcements had received little or no training. In the winter months that followed, the intensity of the fighting dropped, from whence it was possible to engage until February in training newly manned units and restoring combat strength. Already in February 1943, it became clear that despite the lack of full-fledged infantry training, all these units had regained full combat capability. 
Shortly thereafter, our division was sent into action in a renewed offensive, and I was wounded again. A shell splinter struck my left foot and penetrated through the thick leather of my boot, leaving an exit and entrance hole with jagged edges. Fortunately, no bone was involved, and the wound was relatively superficial, suggesting a quick recovery and not requiring evacuation. While under treatment at the regimental medical station, I was notified that I had been earmarked for immediate departure for officers' school. Just as in World War I, the casualty rate among junior officers was extremely high, as follows from the Prussian motto. The life of a lieutenant is the first to live and the first to die. There were no officers at battalion or company level in our regiment at the front who were not wounded, and many fell in battle. It was extremely uncomfortable to feel myself back in the motherland. I was ordered to report to Looneyville, and from there to charter UF on Marne, where the Reserve Forces Command was located. I was further ordered to report to the officers' school at Milovitz, near Prague, as a reservist who in the German army are traditionally kept apart from regular, or professional, soldiers. I remained loyal, but was not overly enthusiastic about the prospect of impending promotion to the officer corps. I soon became involved in strenuous classroom lectures and field exercises, and because of my fresh frontline experience, the instructors saw fit to ask me to familiarize officer candidates with the various situations that might be encountered on the Eastern Front. Suddenly, without any external cause, a wound opened on my leg, and I was forced to spend three weeks in a local military hospital where the doctors attempted to treat my wound. At that time, the German army, unlike the American army, did not have penicillin, and even the most minor wound could develop an infection that could be fatal if not curbed. Indeed, even in that period of medical advances, a stomach wound was generally fatal, and so soldiers were often advised to eat as little as possible before going into battle, because a full stomach increased complications and led to death if hit by a bullet or shrapnel. During the entire period I was in the hospital, I was often visited by officer candidate von Molt, a descendant of our famous Prussian field marshal, who brought me lesson plans and tasks that were given to the class to keep me up to date on what was being taught in school. One afternoon our class commander, Major Richter, while making his rounds of the hospital, stopped by my bedside to talk to me. I was surprised to hear him ask how Oberst Kainsmiller, with whom he had previously served, was doing. Looking through the personnel files of the officer candidates, the Major noticed that I came from a unit under Kainsmiller's command. They had served together in the Frey Corps after World War I during a political upheaval in the 1920s. On my first visit, he expressed concern that I might not be allowed to graduate with my course due to my long absences. So I began to show him what I had managed to do during my convalescence. He was satisfied and leaving, assured me that he would try to help so that the wound would not affect my graduation and subsequent promotion. On December 1, I became a field officer and a lieutenant on the same day. On December 17, the candidates for officers of the 11th class of the military school were brought to Berlin, where we gathered in the sport last to listen to a speech by Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering. About 2,000 freshly minted officers of all branches of the military were seated in order of seniority of their combat decorations. As one of the listeners who had previously been awarded the Iron Cross First Class, I was given the honor of sitting in the front row, only a few meters from the podium. Suddenly, under the deafening sounds of bravura military music, the Reichsmarschall appeared and headed toward the podium. His corpulent body was dressed in a magnificent, dazzling white uniform. Around his neck hung the Grand Iron Cross and the Order of Merit, which he had received in World War I for his exploits as a fighter pilot. As he was the only recipient of the recently resurrected Grand Cross, this deliberate order deliberately obscured the Kaiser's Order of Merit. His chest was covered with gleaming medals and insignia, reflecting his impressive exploits in another war long since ended, as well as, in some cases, the powerful political influence of the more recent past. In his right hand, he firmly clutched a massive jeweled marshal's staff. He began by speaking on political topics and eventually reached the issue of the Eastern Front. 
finally turning to the ongoing disaster at Stalingrad. In the ruins of Stalingrad on the Volga, the remnants of von Paulus's Sixth Army had not yet surrendered to the superior Soviet forces. He therefore still spoke with conviction and authority. He dwelt on his promise to supply the besieged army with Luftwaffe aid, a promise which, as we later learned, he never kept. In a calm, poised tenure, he spoke of the sacrifices we young officers would have to make, of the losses to come, of the resistance we would face, and of the fact that if the enemy came around us from right and left, we should remember the wisdom of the ancients. When you come to Sparta, so we listened to his speech to the point of exhaustion. To emphasize his words, the Rix Marshal began to bang on the rostrum with his baton, and with such force that I thought that at any moment I might be hit by broken jewels. Stalingrad, corrupted by political doctrine, which abused the notions of honor and protection of the country's interests, and stubbornly insisted that it is necessary to hold the territory at any cost, the great commander of all times, that is, our Führer in Berlin, betrayed the army to an agonizing death in the East. As the war progressed further, the willingness of German soldiers to sacrifice themselves became the accepted norm. As the flawed leadership became more and more apparent, the soldiers' willingness to die for political ideas began to wane, which in turn led to an overall decrease in the chances for soldiers to survive this disaster on the Eastern Front. However, the code of honor that had long been inherent in the German soldier, who stood up with arms in defense of the fatherland, remained in his mind. Soldiers continued to sacrifice their lives not for the sake of party members, but for the fatherland. The system was moving further and further away from a humane style of warfare. We were not aware of the full extent of the orders to liquidate and deport Jews and other ethnic groups, considered undesirable from the National Socialist point of view. But we were well aware of those brave men who had served their country faithfully and who, because of differences of ideology, had simply disappeared from our ranks. The Rixmarschall's speech at Sport Palace officially ended our officer training, and after a number of formalities and receiving new orders, we were granted a few weeks' leave for Christmas. That very evening, myself and two other graduates of the officers' school decided to stay in Berlin for a short time to celebrate our newly earned ranks. Three nights later, we boarded trains that took us to various destinations. During several nights of reckless revelry, we unfortunately managed to squander the entire advance on officers' uniforms, which came to about 1,500 Reese marks per person, hired from sleepless nights. I returned to my native Stuttgart, where I arrived devastated and still in my old uniform with the newly purchased officer's insignia hastily sewn onto the uniform. A couple of days later, I received several officers' uniforms as gifts from my parents and close relatives, complete with ceremonial sword and dagger and many of the accessories still required of we are marked officers at this early stage of the war. Germany had reached the zenith of military success. Our forces held a vast amount of territory in the Soviet Union. Victory seemed inevitable. Despite significant problems, Rommel was still winning battles against the British in Africa. We remained confident that the Sixth Army would win at Stalingrad and eventually we would emerge victorious in the crusade against Bolshevism. As an officer with combat decorations, I remained the center of attention in the family circle. I spent several evenings with my uncle Christian, who insisted that his young nephew, fresh from the battlefield in the east, should be introduced to all the relatives. A few years later, in September 1944, when the shadow of imminent defeat was upon us, Uncle Christian died an agonizing death from wounds received in an American air raid on Stuttgart.